Thanks, Charlie. Yes, it is my very great uh, pleasure to introduce uh, Bob Woods. Uh, Bob is special in so many ways, but one of them is that he trained as an evolutionary biologist with Rich Lenski at Michigan State, and so uh, did very substantial high-level evolutionary biology, and then he went to medical school. So he is an MD-PhD, but not with a PhD slotted into the MD, uh, but the MD coming afterwards. He went to medical school at University of Chicago, and he's now a physician scientist at University of Michigan. He spends, I think, 20% of his time uh, dealing with patients, both uh, ward rounding in the hospital and uh, with his clinic that he has every Thursday morning. So Bob is, really embodies this combination of evolutionary biology and uh, medicine, perhaps a way that rather few others do. So Bob is gonna talk for maybe 40, 45 minutes any clarifying questions, obviously, we're going to jump in. Um, but then John LaPuma, who's an uh, infectious disease doc at um, Michigan, is going to say a few words and give a clinical reaction, and then we'll throw, the, throw it open for discussion. So thanks very much for coming, everybody. And Bob, especially great that you are here today to talk about uh, antibiotic resistance. All right. Well, thank, thank you very much for the introduction. Let me... Um, start the talk here and make sure that you guys can 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 see me. Does that look right? Yep, looks great. All right, so uh, so I really I've I've enjoyed a number of these talks, and uh, when um, I had the invitation to talk about our research um, for Club Avmed, um, and with the the idea that it should be something a little bit other than my my typical research, more uh, engaging, more interaction, more interactive. Um, I knew what I want to talk about, um, but I, it's, uh, um, it's, it's not the standard talk. And this all came out of this, this sort of unique background of having some history of ev um, being an evolutionary biologist and treating patients. And I treat a lot of patients, um, and I use antibiotics a lot, and I see antibiotic resistance a lot, right? It's one of the reasons you consult an infectious disease specialist. Um, and I think about the resistance. And one thing that's become um, really striking to me over the last several years and <laughs> several other infectious disease doctors on a call here um, is that is how often the answer to this, this question is, um, is no, right? So how, you know, when I'm at the bedside, um, coming up with an antibiotic treatment plan uh, for my patients, how often does the evolutionary biology uh, have something meaningful to say about which, you know, among the various choices I have to give uh, to the patient, uh, does the evolutionary theory really play a role in that? And it's really a striking disconnect, uh, given the, the um, how important antibiotic resistance has been for the field of evolution, right? It's a, been a kind of a central um, example of evolution in action that's used to advance fundamental evolutionary theory. Um, but it's sort of, I think, one of the the challenges we're facing is how limited of an impact that uh, evolutionary theory has had on antibiotic prescribing uh, in, in particular, and it's actually how we should use antibiotics. So I'm just going to take a little, um, the first part of the talk is sort of uh, clarifying exactly what I mean by antibiotic resistance and, and, and what would an evolutionary um, informed treatment strategy uh, for antibiotics resistance look like. Um, and then I'm going to talk about why that has been very difficult to translate to, to, to patients and then a little bit of the um, sort of what we could do to make things better. Um, so to start out with, I have uh, uh, absolutely no disclosures. Um, so antibiotic resistance, uh, you know, if you look in kind of textbooks or papers that define antibiotic resistance, it's almost always has a bacteriologic definition, right? So you have a sensitive bacterium. Um, that uh, at one point you could treat with antibiotics and those kill the, the bug, uh, but through some process, the bacteria become resistant, right? Now you treat them with antibiotic and they, um, and they no longer respond. And this process, right, so, some process by which you go from the sensitive population to resistance population is of course evolution, right? There's no question that the problem of antibiotic resistance the, the global crisis of antibiotic resistance is a problem of evolution, right? The process that we are trying to, to thwart is, uh, is exactly evolutionary biology. 
um, so as, a, as a side note, um, if you want to be particularly discouraged, you can go to some of the major publications on antibiotic resistance. Um, uh, those would be the, the CDC's threat report or the WHO's uh, position statement or even the um, O'Neill report out of the UK on antibiotic resistance uh, and just search for how many times they mention the word evolution, right? And it's um, just, it's, it's zero, right? So that's the, the fact that this is an fundamentally an evolutionary process um, and that it's, um, and this is the, the global um, a crisis of antibiotic resistance um, uh, is uh, leading to this, what I think is quite a sort of paradox of uh, the lack of evolutionary biology in our um, treatment strategies. Right? And all the more of a um, surprise because and a, um, the evolution of antibiotic resistance is completely described, um, especially if you can, uh, if you look at uh, experimental populations, uh, we have the mathematical theory, we know the genetics, we can describe it in um, experimental populations. Essentially, you have two processes, right? There's, there's, there's the processes that, that generate heritable variation, right? And those, um, for example, mutation. And then you have a process that acts on that heritable variation, which is, um, for the most part, in antibiotic resistance. It's selection, um, and and it's through these processes you have origin of variants, right? That might be less susceptible to antibiotic. The antibiotic is applied, causing selection for those variants. More mutations can happen, and over time you get a, a more resistant population, right? And the only source of genetic variation is not uh, mutation, right? You can also have horizontal gene transfer that's kind of foreign DNA carrying resistance, resistance um, genes. Um, and you can also have invasion of another species, right? That you, you'd have a site of infection and a resistant bug, a separate a strain can pop in and spread. But that's more or less it, right? So we have, a, small set of sources of variation, right? And then we have the process of selection and competition um, um, that, that drive the antibiotic resistance crisis. Right? And I'm not trying to sort of sell short all the complex evolutionary dynamics there and all the complex behavior, things like uh, biofilms and persister uh, populations, et cetera, but, but we, you can define these dynamics and you can, you can explicitly define a better treatment strategy. So what does that look like? Um, it's what we refer to as antibiotic resistance management. And that's when we use antibiotics in a way that's sort of informed by understanding those evolutionary dynamics in a way that we best slow the emergence of resistance. In order to do that, you need to recognize that the antibiotics don't treat all those processes the same way. Right? So imagine, so that's because the sensitive population of bacteria, right? They lead to resistance, right? They actually contribute to the resistance process uh, through some of these processes. So mutation, the more sensitives that you have around, the more resistant strains you get through mutation. And if the horizontal gene transfer is proportional to the amount of susceptible, then that can also um, lead to more resistance. But the susceptible population also can, can suppress the resistance population. Um, we can do that either by through competition with the resistance that are there or by preventing the invasion of uh, resistant strains into the site of infection. And then the use of antibiotics um, then is, uh, is it's how we suppress the antibiotics only kill the susceptibles, right? not the resistance because they're resistant. Um, and the question is how do we use antibiotics to best suppress those sensitives um, to best balance those risks of, uh, of the harm due to uh, sensitive driving resistance and the benefit that we get. One common way of uh, describing that um, is to see how those different forces uh, change with increasing amount of antibiotic applied to the infection. So the more antibiotic you apply, the stronger the selection is, whereas the more antibiotic you apply, if you're cutting down the population substantially, there's less bugs around to evolve resistance, so there's less mutation supply. And the total risk of resistance, um, something like an inverted U, where the little bit of antibiotic doesn't drive resistance or a whole lot of antibiotic doesn't drive resistance, but an intermediate 
and that does. Um, and so how does, how does that look when we think about how we um, apply this uh, to specific patient situations? And um, we're gonna show you now is, a, um, is one example. And in fact, there's sort of uh, over the last seven or eight year, years, there've been a whole bunch of examples of, of ways in which clever evolutionary biologists have figured out um, how, to, how to leverage the specific, specific details of the system, of a particular infectious system to, to pre prevent resistance from emerging. And as I said, even in some cases reverse um, the, the resistance back to population back to a sensitive state. And so I'm gonna just go through uh, quickly a, a few handfuls of those. So you see what I mean when I say we have um, options that evolutionary biology can inform how we use antibiotics. Uh, and this one is uh, a theory paper uh, that was sort of mostly the work of Elsa Hansen working with uh, Andrew Reed um, and myself, um, where she uh, describes the change in the population density, um, so the, the pathogen population over time. And this, imagine this pathogen population has, uh, as it's mostly sensitive here in gray, but there's a small amount of resistance here in red. And then as that pathogen go, increases in density, it's gonna cross some threshold that becomes a clinical problem, at which point you need to treat um, with antibiotic to really drive that back down below the point at which it's a clinical problem. And Elsa's insight here is that, it, that most of the time, the antibiotics actually drive it even further than that, um, that potentially to zero. Um, and that, but that as you continue the antibiotic um, treatment, the resistance continued to rise. And her, at some point, they will pass the threshold of which then you become a problem and you're no longer able to treat them. And so her, her insight here was that if you leave, this, this, once you get down to the point at which the susceptibles are um, no longer causing a clinical problem, should you leave them around because they can competitively suppress the resistant population? And the answer to that is that it depends on the relative balance of these forces. How much does the, do the sensitives suppress the resistant population and slow its growth relative to the amount that contribute to resistance through the, um, through the, through the supply of more mutations? Um, and in, in this, this paper, she, she carefully said, she very nicely showed that if you know the contributions of all of those, right, you, can, you can actually determine the, the optimal treatment strategy. Um, uh, even, even nicer, um, so this has been shown experimentally with the help of uh, Kevin Wood, who's here at the University of Michigan and his graduate student, to show that you actually have devices that can do exactly this. So these, uh, could, um, uh, these morbidostats where you're sort of, you grow the bacteria, both sensitive and resistant. And if you're measuring the density of bacteria, you can add just enough antibiotic to keep them below your, uh, what we refer to as the acceptable burden. And when you do that and you compare the, you treat two control populations with just the sensitive or just the resistant populations with the exact same treatment um, course of antibiotics, you can show that it's, it is exactly the, the presence of the sensitives that um, suppresses the resistance. So you see here the mixed population with sensitive resistant can be maintained below um, your threshold whereas the resistant population alone um, outgrows that, showing that in fact this sort of adaptive therapy works uh, very well in a, in a test tube. Here's another uh, example that has nothing to do with, with my work, but it's a nice uh, re review um, of some work from Roy Kashoni's lab. Um, when they talk about what you, how you can use antibiotics if you have two antibiotic options and, then, and you have two strains, what they show is if you have, they describe as if you have two, if you look at how those strains are affected at different combinations of uh, one drug and another drug, and the wild type can grow everywhere that is gray, and the mutant can grow everywhere that is red, all these mutants are resistant to drug A because they can grow at higher concentrations. But depending on how they trade off that concentration, um, their, their ability to grow at other levels, um, you can come up with and identify antibiotic concentrations that can actually drive selection towards the more sensitive bug. Um, 
Um, and, and finally, uh, again, the paper that's not my own, but a very, uh, very nice uh, paper from Kevin Wood's lab again uh, with Jeff Maltus. Um, they show if you have multiple drugs that are potentially available, um, how you can use those optimally. And here they, they select for resistance among um, for four different, in four different antibiotic settings, and then test how resistant they become um, in, to other antibiotics. And not surprisingly, when you select for resistance, for example, for phosphomycin, you get phosphomycin resistance. But you see you also sometimes get not just resistance, but you can drive that uh, collateral susceptibility to other drugs. And what, may, what they did, which was um, what's really nice, is they, they used these kind of observed collateral um, susceptibility matrix um, to identify um, an optimal treatment strategy. So they used optimal control theory um, to, to devise the best uh, series of drug treatments. And what made this one of my favorite papers um, of that year is that they not just sort of made this prediction, they went into the, uh, the lab and they tested that. And they showed that, in fact, if you know this uh, trade-off matrix um, and you run that's the, the evolution of um, this optimal cycling, it, it outperforms all the individual, you know, the, the selection with individual drugs, um, the selection with the various combinations of two drugs, and even the selection combination with one. And so, like, like I said, these are not the, um, these are just three examples of how evolutionary theory has come up with really clever ways of using antibiotics to prevent the emergence of resistance. Um, and the question is, uh, why has that not translated into to better care of patients? And, and all these, these ideas not translated into better care of patients. Uh, and there are a number of ideas. Uh, one is this is a lot, a lot of, uh, a lot of this theory is new, not the fundamental theory, but a lot of the, the examples are new and much of the, the experimentation is new. Um, and so maybe it's taking time to get uh, into clinical practice. But the, I wanna focus on uh, a, what I think is a bigger problem. And that is that, that most of the antibiotic resistance that in the way we study it in labs is not the same thing as the resistance we see in the clinic. And I think there's a fundamental sort of disconnect between the, the, the types of problems I face and the decision process that I have to perform when I'm at a patient's bedside and the sort of studies and the way that evolutionary biologists tend to think about the problem. And so to, to give you an example of that, I'm gonna walk through um, this case report is one that was included in the, uh, the announcement um, uh, to demonstrate why I, we sort of struggled with translating evolutionary theory into particular patient scenarios. And I'm going to use a, a, the standard format for a clinical um, presentation as sort of um, uh, uh, chief complaint, history, uh, present illness, uh, et cetera. I just started explaining why I'm uh, discussing it this way. So the patient um, was one that I saw uh, uh, now seven years ago. Um, and the chief complaint was that they had drainage from the drive line. So this patient um, has end-stage heart failure, uh, which required um, this uh, left ventricular assist device, which is a mechanical pump that's attached to the heart and, and takes over some of the cardiac, the, the pumping function of the heart, um, without which the patient could not survive. So it pumps blood out of the, um, the left ventricle, and then there's an outflow tract that comes up and pushes the blood into the aorta. And all of this is powered by this uh, uh, this cord called a drive line that's connected to the battery pack. And the patient said that I'm having drainage um, of bacteria from the drive line. Um, uh, her uh, history of present illness, so she's um, uh, middle aged, she has uh, not ischemic cardiomyopathy uh, with LVAD that she's been in place for two years without any complications. Uh, and she really has no other symptoms uh, that she's presenting with. Her past medical history is significant for diabetes and obesity blood clots, and then several complications from a heart failure, including pulmonary hypertension and atrial fibrillation. And she has other hardware in her body that's um, including this uh, defibrillator. Uh, on exam, it's really unremarkable except for the small uh, amount of fluid draining from her, um, the drive line where it gets exits the skin. And her labs are remarkable only for the growth of MRSA from that drainage. So we cultured the drain into MRSA. So what follows is the 
time course um, for this patient. So I'm going to show you across about the year and a half that I cared for her um, on this diagram. The pink areas will be when she came into the hospital. Uh, and then these, when the treatment decisions, the antibiotics we used are here in blue. And I'll show the, the antibiotic, um, or I said the bacteria and its susceptibility here with, uh, with squares. The MRSA are squares and they're gonna be green when susceptible um, and then become red as there's resistance. And initially we uh, left her on vancomycin, which is a good drug for, for MRSA. Um, eventually though, I, uh, so that it did not stop the drainage, there was still a culture positive six weeks in. At some point I switched to an oral antibiotic, um, really to avoid the complications from the IV access. And, um, however, that led to the patient not only gaining resistance to clindamycin, but uh, clinically worsening because the bacteria was not only in the draining from the drive line, but now is in her bloodstream. Uh, so I switched back to vancomycin. The patient came in and out of the hospital for other reasons. Uh, was at one point switched to daptomycin, which is another good IV therapy for MRSA. Um, but, uh, but nonetheless progressed, continued to have drainage in the drive line. And at this point, about 240 days into the course, um, significantly worsens because the, um, it's now resistant to clindamycin and daptomycin. Uh, but additionally, um, having significant amount of chest pain and we can see why, which is on the CAT scan, the infection has progressed as well. So this is a coronal uh, section showing the, that outflow track of the, the, um, the heart pump. And around it, there's a lot of inflammation. This is all infection surrounding the entirety of the heart pump. There are small black dots here, which are, um, which are bubbles of gas. So this um, now has a significant progression despite the antibiotic therapy. Uh, this, uh, th this was kind of uh, washed out, but could not be removed uh, safely. Uh, so she's kind of, so this is uh, the LVAD can't be, be removed. When they wash it out, they also culture, in addition to the MRSA, a second species now, we're culturing Enterobacter. So there's been an invasion of the Enterobacter into the site of infection. Uh, we treat that now with, with two drugs. Uh, we, we see resistance showing up to cefepime. And um, so we switch to meropenem. And I keep trying to switch to oral antibiotics uh, in order to avoid pick lines. But every time I do, she fails and gets worse. And at one point comes into the hospital about a year into therapy with almost with very few antibiotics left. And so uh, at this point, right, I, uh, it's clear that the patient is most likely going to, um, to succumb to, to this infection. And she's probably gonna to succumb to the antibiotic resistant infection. Right? And that is the, uh, it is the process of evolution, the thing that we should sort of all know about um, that should help us uh, slow down uh, resistance. Right? And this, uh, out of a sort of a remarkable coincidence, right? When what do you do when resistance threatens your patient's life? I happen to have been um, rounding in the hospital with an evolutionary biologist, not just any evolutionary biologist, Andrew Reed, who you saw earlier, um, sort of a world expert in how to use um, uh, antibiotics to slow the spread of resistance. And, and we, so we sat down and we thought through all, all the possibilities that were sort of viable clinical possibilities to treat this patient. Right? So there's, um, we could continue, go back to one drug, the, one, the single strongest drug, and use that as long as possible. We can go back to the second line drug that we used earlier and there was some partial resistance to, right, cefepime. Uh, we could begin to use combinations, right? Either of those two drugs for which there's susceptibility, um, or we could do a combination with the one strong drug and um, a drug to which there's resistance because of this possible um, uh, sort of interesting Cushoni type uh, interactions that we could uh, potentially find. And finally, we could uh, do, common, do short bursts of drugs that would be too toxic for a tolerant long term, but might give her a short term benefit. Um, so we have a set of antibi uh, options. And what really sort of drove home the fact that the evolutionary biology didn't ha have a lot to, to contribute here is that despite the fact that we, we had discussions, but went through the theory 
went through uh, extensive literature search uh, on the various options, uh, what we ended up doing was exactly what I would have done, right, had we not had those discussions, right? So in that case, evolutionary biology, even with sort of the, the world leaders in evolutionary biology, right, um, didn't contribute at all to the treatment of this, this particular uh, patient. Right. The conclusion of the case is that the patient, um, we went with what I would have done anyway, what most of my colleagues would have done anyway, uh, which is go with the single strongest drug, which was, which was meropenem. Bactrim was kept on uh, to treat in case there was potentially some uh, uh, MRSA still around. And eventually resistance to meropenem did arise and the patient um, was hospitalized and uh, succumbed to the infection. And, and what I'd say is this really is a, um, a failure of our science, right? So this, is, this should be exactly the sort of situation where we should be able to look at the case and, and, um, and come up with better treatment options. And so what I'm going to sort of now it's kind of step through is what I think is sort of the reason that, um, that I was saying the antibiotic resistance is not clinical resistance. And that I would draw this distinction because the clinical resistance is the problem that we as uh, clinicians uh, need, are, are facing and are thinking about as we're trying to make these various uh, treatment options. Okay. Uh, and clinical resistance, right? Instead of seeing a, um, a bug that needs to be treated, I see a patient, right? That at one point you could treat and that's sensitive, but, but antibiotic resistance clinically just means that you treat them for your patient with an antibiotic and they don't get better or perhaps they get worse. And I'm not, um, some, I'm, I'm not denying the germ theory uh, of infection here, right? So I do believe there's infections underlying that, but often uh, those aren't, um, but the problem is not the resistance per se, it's that the patients are getting worse. Uh, moreover, the process of evolution, that is that's going from a patient who's got a sensitive infection to resistant infection, um, uh, it takes on a different characteristics when you think about how that's packaged into particular patients. Right. So in fact, I think we should, um, it's useful to, to, I, to separate the resistance, the types of clinical resistance into four categories. In fact, most resistance that we would see as doctors fall into one of these four, uh, four types. And these are the things we have on our mind, uh, more or less, when we're thinking about how to prescribe an antibiotic. And um, that is sort of immediate resistance. That is, the patient already is, has a resistant bug and they're not gonna do well because, um, uh, because the antibiotic doesn't cover it. Uh, then there's delayed resistance. So be, initially they get better, but a resistance evolves within that same patient, within that same infection, and then they do worse. Um, subsequent resistance, that is you can effectively treat this infection, but they're gonna, that same patient's gonna come back with a second infection which is gonna be resistant and that's gonna be the harm to the patient. Or transmission resistance, which is the, the resistance that you're driving by prescribing this antibiotic is actually harming somebody else, right? So you drive resistance and that moves to another person. And these four categories um, are really the way um, we should be thinking about uh, resistance. Well, we do think about it clinically and we should be thinking about it for, um, uh, from an evolutionary biology standpoint. Um, and the reason is that these, these, uh, these are the sort of techniques that we can, um, the sort of uh, management techniques we have available are tightly linked to the type of resistance that we see. For example, if, uh, the, if I look at a patient and my, my biggest concern is immediate resistance, and I have to say most antibiotic prescribing is driven by this. Um, it's actually most kind of um, broad spectrum antibiotic use is driven by this, that we're much more worried about missing a bug than we are um, about over-treating and potentially driving resistance to drugs, right? So how do we do that less? We can, uh, how do we improve uh, the treatment of these infections? Rapid diagnostics where we can quickly identify which, uh, what bacteria are present and, and which antibiotics are most effective, right? You can know your local epidemiology, right? If you know which, the, the pattern of resistance in your hospital, you can do a better job of picking antibiotics that cover the likely organisms, right? If you, you are aware of the patient's particular history, the history of recent antibiotic use and also the organisms that have been cultured in the past. Um, and most importantly, and somewhat overlooked is just uh, being a good doctor, right? And making sure that 
uh, you've made a good diagnosis before you uh, start treatment so that you can target the, the infection they have. Uh, similarly, if you're worried about delayed resistance, and that is where initially the patient gets better and then subsequently worsens, right, we have, uh, there are things we do. We can uh, do ongoing sampling of the, of the patient to identify resistance as it's emerging. Um, and in, um, we can try adaptive treatment strategies, as we mentioned, uh, antibiotic combinations, and importantly, source control. Um, if you're worried about subsequent resistance, and this is a situation in which you treat initially, then there's um, the patient gets better, they come back with a second unrelated infection. Maybe it's the same bug, maybe it's a different bug, but it's a, uh, now resistant to the antibiotics. Right? You, um, um, right, we have another suite of, um, of potential management techniques. We have the ones we had before, plus now infection prevention, right, preventing this patient from being colonized with a new resistant organism. Um, we can potentially use decolonization. That is, if you identify that they're colonized with MRSA, you can, for example, you can uh, decolonize them, decrease their chance of subsequent infection. And there are also, there's kind of a, a, the whole uh, suite of ways in which we can protect those off-target populations, right? So this resistant bug um, very likely was not at the site of the prior infection, but was in an off-target population, that is in the intestinal tract or on the skin, was exposed to the antibiotics and then led to um, resistance. And there are ways, um, including uh, uh, techniques that we've shown recently with the drug called cholestyramine can pr protect those off-target populations. Other people have shown that you can absorb the antibiotic in the gut with, um, with various drugs uh, or break them up uh, by using beta-lactamases if you're treating beta-lactamase and really protect those off-target populations. Um, and finally, but for transmitted resistance, when it doesn't hurt, the, the antibiotic I prescribe um, ends up having harm not in the patient I'm treating, but in a subsequent patient. Uh, there, of course, are, are yet more um, management techniques, such as um, contact precautions to prevent transmission between patients and surveillance, right, seeing um, across the population to see the prevalence is particularly useful in hospitals. And so what I want to propose is that the, the, the biggest challenge we're having in translating evolutionary, um, these, these evolutionary ideas on how to use treatment, uh, use antibiotics to prevent resistance from being a, becoming a problem, is that we're having trouble with the mapping of the clinical resistance to those eco-evolutionary mechanisms that we talked that I mentioned at the beginning. So as the, the physician, right, I'm thinking about these, each of these processes, right, and then I have to, to imagine how it's gonna affect the balance between these different forces, right? How is this gonna contribute to the, to, um, the likelihood of resistance emerging de novo? How much is it gonna act on selection among the existing strains? Uh, how much do I have to worry about the antibiotic treatment affecting the rates of uh, horizontal gene transfer? or the likelihood of that happening. And I have to weigh that both for the immediate resistance and the delayed resistance and subsequent resistance and the risk of transmission. And that, that calculation right, is uh, it's a very difficult, for one, we don't, have, um, we don't have data for the vast majority of those, um, those possible those sort of uh, weighted probabilities of each of these outcomes, but we, uh, but it's a very complicated dis, um, process to go through. And so what I, um, thinking about it this way actually makes a couple of our successes uh, uh, more understandable, right? And so you think about the treatment of HIV, right? So HIV is a, a, a disease that um, the emergence of resistance was sort of the main threat. Uh, once drugs were initially um, uh, discovered, uh, the resistance was the main threat to, to effective therapy. And we have very good evolutionary robust treatment strategies now. Um, but in this scenario, there was really with delayed resistance, right? It was delayed resistance mostly coming through mutation and then selection on those mutants. 
And this combination therapy, which we call highly active antiretroviral therapy, right, is effective evolutionary robust treatment strategy, right? So that's an evolutionary management, um, resistance management strategy. And there's no conflict, right? Because if you suppress the HIV in the patient, so um, you effectively prevent transmission, right? Um, it overcomes the immediate resistance problems if you might have uh, pre-existing resistance to some strains, right? And there is no subsequent resistance um, problem, right? Your HIV is there, you're treating it. Um, there's really no off-target selection. Right? So these, um, so some of our wins make more sense, um, but you know, the patients like ours, it also makes more sense why it's, why it's complicated, right? Instead, I'm worried that I'm going to not cover a bug that's there causing a problem in the patient. I'm very worried about what did happen to the patient, which delayed resistance. Right? Um, and I'm worried about subsequent resistance. As we already saw that the patient had an infection with MRSA and then got subsequently invaded by, uh, by gram-negative Entrobacter. Right? And how, how do we weigh each of these choices? With the um, treatment strategies that, that Andrew and I went through, sort of five options, right? Um, there was no way to, to sort of ask how does the, uh, how did each one of those differentially impact um, uh, each of these possibilities? All right, so I, so that sort of laying out the problem, I think there's, um, of course, I think this is a, this is an achievable, this is a um, goal, right, that, that we can make significant progress um, by translating these, by, by, by working on uh, making the connections, um, so understanding um, how antibiotic treatment affects these different uh, pathways. I'll give you just uh, one example, um, some follow-up work that we've done on this specific patient and try to understand this process of delayed resistance that happened in the enterobacter um, over time. And so what I'm showing you here is a, a, there are nine isolates of the enterobacter um, that were collected from the patient. And the number behind uh, the E is the day of um, since the enterobacter was introduced or first cultured. Right, so this is so this is the first uh, enterobacter that was isolated from the patient. Um, here's one at day 43, day 100, and day 143, and then all of these that came later. And we, when we sequenced the whole genome of these nine, uh, we could cleanly make a phylogenetic tree. Um, and uh, moreover, we saw there's no introduction of horizontal gene transfer, no homologous recombination, no foreign D DNA that um, they came in. So this was entirely a process of de novo evolution, so mutation and selection on those mutants. Uh, we, um, we identified a total of 58 mutations, so this is a multi-step process uh, of, uh, of evolution. I've highlighted here with these dark um, um, symbols, uh, key mutations leading to resistance, the likely associated with the resistance to the last line drug. And we see that there actually were, were several different lineages. And these lineages uh, each picked up beneficial mutations, suggesting that the, the supply of mutations, or the population was large enough, right, that there was lots of supply of beneficial mutations. So we, um, and if anything, more antibiotic to suppress that might have been, might have been better. So we definitely were losing the battle in terms of uh, mutation supply. Um, but interestingly, these different lineages that shared no, um, no additional mutations, um, you know, each picked up resistance on their own, right? So this earliest one was the most sensitive strain, and resistance emerged um, across, you know, independently across these three lineages. And in fact, those, there was no single bug that was the, the resistant to all of our antibiotics. Right? And in the, in the end, the, the resistance we saw to each of our antibiotics happened in different lineages, suggesting that, that in fact, pan drug, the, 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 the extensive drug resistance was a product of the, the population and not individual strains. Uh, so, which, which suggests that combination therapy is, is a viable option. We also uh, looked at, uh, uh, at combinations, especially the meropenem and cefepime. Here I'm again showing you these, uh, the, the same phylogenetic tree, but here I've coded the, the tips. 
And so we can look at how they grow in different combinations of the antibiotic. And so here we're doing cefepime and meropenem. And um, along these bottom four isolates, uh, we can see that as they became more and more resistant to cefepime, they had collateral resistance to, to meropenem. So there's no kind of useful trade-off there uh, that we can leverage. But interestingly, when we look at the top group of five strains, they do have, they have a significantly different um, uh, interaction between these antibiotics. So using here, we see that we, we have this um, antagonism. That is that the meropenem, a little bit of meropenem allows you to grow in higher doses of cefepime, which was exactly the sort of dynamic that, that uh, Kashoni and, and, and others suggested you potentially could use. Unfortunately here, the evolution uh, among these said as they, they, don't, they don't have a shift which sort of reveals um, a drug concentration where you can select for the most sensitive, the most resistant incorporates all of that, that area. There, when you put all those together, there is, uh, I, it does suggest that there is some collateral resist, uh, resistance between these two major clades and that you could potentially leverage, right? So alternating between meropenem and cefepime, you might be able to push it back towards this lower group, but again, that lower group um, also within the lower group, the trajectory of evolution tended to be collateral resistance, suggesting it's not a long-term solution. Um, so, so that's a sort of a, so the work we're continuing to do to look at that um, the one patient. But what I'd like to mention now is sort of how does that explanation, how does um, this case make me think about uh, what we should do going forward? And that is, you know, how do we begin to, to make evolutionary um, medicine translatable into to better antibiotic treatment strategies? And first of all, I think we need a, we need a whole lot more clinical studies. Um, and that is where the clinical studies um, uh, explicitly try to link the, the clinical manifestations of resistance and that is the, the patient harm um, explicitly to those evolutionary underlying evolutionary mechanisms. Right? We have we have uh, rapidly increasing numbers of clinical studies, and we for for decades have studied antibiotic resistance clinically. But being able to tie it to specific evolutionary mechanisms, right? Whether that's um, driven by mutation or invasion, um, um, the sort of tra transmission, it, it's it's seldom done uh, cleanly. Um, and, and finally, um, which is more of a topic of discussion for discussion, is that um, is that patients that the sort of large scale uh, clinical studies um, are just not going to be possible for all patients. Right? The patient that I described to you right, uh, has sort of a unique history, and she has uh, this uh, Enterobacter infection. Um, and what I we don't know is how. Um, how repeatable that particular case was. Right? Are there, if we come up with an evolutionary robust strategy for that particular enterobacter, is that going to um, translate to a patient who then comes in, next patient comes in with a pseudomonas infection or a Klebsiella infection, or even worse, is it dependent on the particular strain um, or other particular patient characteristics? And I think uh, really understanding the fundamental scale which evolution is repeatable across patients and clinical scenarios is one of um, the, the important future goals for, um, for evolutionary medicine. Um, so uh, with that, I, um, hopefully we, I've given enough um, of a background to lead to some dis discussion. I do want to acknowledge this of, uh, a wonderful uh, environment that I work in. So people in my lab who've done a lot of work on this, um, including Camilo uh, Barbosa, um, and then Kevin Wood, uh, uh, who is here at the University of Michigan, associate professor, and his lab who really contributed to our thinking on this, and then my collaborators, especially Andrew Reed, um, <laughs> um, um, who's helped, and his lab who've helped think about this. So, um, with that, I'll open it up to, to questions. Well, thanks very much, Bob. Um, there's quite a few questions. Uh, uh, but before we go to those, I'm just wondering if um, um, John LaPuma wants to react as a clinician. Uh, for those of you who don't know John, he's a 
pediatric infectious disease specialist at the University of Michigan's Mott Children's Hospital. Uh, I know him for his work on cystic fibrosis. And cystic fibrosis is a situation where one of the biggest threats is the evolution of drug resistant bugs in the cystic fibrosis lung. And that's frequently the, um, frequently the cause of, of death. Uh, John, are you there for a couple of minutes reaction to that? Sure. I'm not sure where to start, really. It was a lot to, to think about and to chew on. I think the main question that, that Bob is posing is how do we <clears throat> translate uh, emerging knowledge in, into clinical practice in, in treating really difficult infections, infections due to multidrug resistant bacteria? And uh, it's something that I think about, Bob thinks about anyone online who's an uh, infectious disease uh, physician or a clinical microbiologist thinks about this all the time. Uh, and there's not a, a simple, easy answer. You know, we think back, well, when I was training, you know, we think back, you know, things used to be a lot simpler, it seemed, right? We had Cook's hypotheses, you know, would, you know one, one bacteria, one infection, treat it with an antibiotic, get a microbiologic cure, you're done. And now, uh, increasingly, uh, things aren't so straightforward. And I think that those of us uh, in, in practice are faced with, um, I think it's fair to say more complex patients, um, polymicrobial infections, chronic infections uh, that really um, challenge our ability to, to affect the microbiologic cure. And we're constantly thinking about uh, multidrug resistant bacteria. So you mentioned cystic fibrosis, my area of, of interest. First of all, can all of you hear me all right? I should, I should always start with that because sometimes I sound like um, this computer makes me sound like a munchkin. So I want to make sure you're all okay. Um, you know, so we deal with, with uh, you know, chronic infections, you know, either, whether it's a hardware in the case uh, that Bob presented, cystic fibrosis in which the airways are chronically infected. We, we can't really eradicate bacteria from the airways of people with CF. So this is just these are chronic, uh, prolonged, many, many years worth of infection. So you've got a lot of opportunity for bacteria to evolve, if you will, uh, in vivo uh, and develop uh, resistance. Uh, we treat patients with uh, chronic osteomyelitis, bone infection, chronic uh, decubitus uh, ulcers, uh, bed sores. And, and so uh, increasingly we have these complex scenarios Lots of bacteria to think about have been infecting the individual for a very long time and, uh, and we're really rather lost. So to better understand the evolutionary uh, principles and processes that might allow us to translate into better strategies is, is certainly welcome. The, you know, the question is, well, why haven't we translated this yet? And, and I'll, I'll pose a couple things, and, and maybe, let me be a little provocative. Um, you know, we, we now, I think increasingly over the time that I've been doing this business, we rely on standards of care. So a lot more of our care is protocol driven, evidence-based, uh, you know, and so it, it in, and in many ways that's been a real uh, improvement in the way we deliver care. Uh, we shouldn't think that every physician who treats a patient does things in an entirely different way. There are ways that have been shown to be better than other ways. Similarly, um, antibiotic stewardship is now something that we're very uh, tuned into. We want to use antibiotics in the most appropriate way so as to not drive resistance. Uh, we want to withhold antibiotics uh, in situations where they, they may not be uh, needed or have marginal benefit. And, and so the point I want to make is that both of those things are very important, and I think have been advances. On the other hand, right, the flip side, I think of that coin, is that um, protocol-driven medicine, standard of care, uh, stewardship really confines us, I think, a little bit more, and it, in, in some ways prevents some out-of-the-box thinking. And it, it in many ways, uh, you know, again, being provocative, sort of hinders innovation. So how do you then take new knowledge from evolutionary ideas, uh, some of the things that Bob talked about, and translate those into clinical medicine at a time when you're really, by now increasing convention, confined by stewardship principles 
by standards of care. So we don't really have the, we always have the freedom to do what we want to some degree in medicine, but, but it, it, it's increasingly difficult to say, you know, I think I should use miropenemin cefepime on this patient because I've got some evidence in the lab that I can get collateral susceptibility. Or I think I should use a strange combination. I had a, a discussion recently, and I'll stop in a minute, um, where we, we did a study and it looked like the combination of, um, of uh, uh, piperacillin and uh, abubactam um, would restore susceptibility to some of the bacteria we deal with in, in cystic fibrosis. Well, that combination isn't available commercially, so we had to give the patient ceftazidime abubactam and piperacillin tazobactam. Now, giving those two combinations, that combination of, of antibiotic is, is not only out of the box, I mean, people sort of laugh at you and say that doesn't make any sense at all. So to Bob's point, you know, how do we translate new knowledge, new understanding of the evolution of resistance into clinical medicine? I think it's very difficult. I agree entirely we need more clinical um, studies that, that show some benefit, but this is, this is hard to do. Uh, and so that translation of new knowledge into clinical practice is, a, is sometimes a very long, difficult road. Uh, and I think the only way to get there is to continue to learn as much as we can about some of these principles and then slowly introduce them by way of providing some evidence, doing some clinical studies that will give people assurances that when you make these recommendations, you're not just a complete crackpot and that there's actually some rationale behind what you're trying to do. And so let me stop there with those, those ideas. Thanks very much, John. I really appreciate those comments. And I do remember when Bob and I were trying to treat that patient or Bob was trying to treat that patient, that precise issue about there are protocols and when you deviate from them and you need some evidence to deviate from best practice. Yeah, okay. Um, in terms of hands up, uh, Michael Hochberg. Hi, Michael. Hello there. <clears throat> I really enjoyed your talk. I'd like to play devil's advocate a bit. Um, no doubt that focusing on resistance um, will lead to the insights that we need to tackle these problems of. Uh, managing or curing disease, but I think what's missing here is the ecology and how we're limited by the information, what we actually know about what's going on in, in an infection. Um, so I'm thinking about if you're treating with a given antibiotic and don't realize that there's actually a biofilm that's formed or persisters that are present or um, that there's some kind of habitat refuge for the bacteri bacterium such that the drug is not diffusing homogeneously into the target area. All of these factors could contribute to promoting resistant strains, mutants uh, emerging. So I'm just wondering what kind of re reflections you would have as a practicing doctor in terms of how we can gain more information and use the information to more efficiently and optimally use these drugs either singly or, or in combination. Yeah, I, I think that's um, that's a great point. That uh, that it's, it's very clear that the a bunch of the behaviors of the bacteria, right? So that's biofilm formation or these uh, persisters exactly how they respond, bacteria respond to the antibiotics, as well as the, the, the ecology between different species, right? These are complex communities, uh, needs to be studied. Um, and, and I glossed over that a little bit, but essentially, you know, every time we use an antibiotic, when we, if we design our clinical studies to measure those outcomes, right, um, it should include, right, understand, if we give an antibiotic and that leads to disruption of the microbiome, which allows invasion of a second bug, right, that we can monitor that by giving antibiotics and then and screening the, the, um, the microbiome over time. And similarly, I think, you know, we should include, um, you know, uh, if we think biofilm formation is an important mechanism that, that, that facilitates the emergence of resistance, but then, then looking at that explicitly, right? But I think that really the, the, the goal should be to understand those mechanisms in their clinical context. So I guess just to summarize what I'm 
trying to say is that in a way we're ironically recapitulating the idea of the magic bullet and thinking we have to go for the resistant bug that's the target and there's actually much more going on in the habitat. And the question is to what extent in these difficult to treat situations can we get the information necessary to maybe better select the particular drugs or other agents such as phages um, that could be used um, and improve these therapies and actually indirectly uh, deal with the resistance problem. I, yeah, I, I agree. We definitely need, I think it's, um, yeah, we need to understand each of those dynamics uh, um, and, okay. and, and the role they play. Um, uh, that's related to a question that um, uh, John Pepper asked earlier, uh, Bob, about whether or not it's really the end of the antibiotic era. Why are we trying to figure out how to use them better? Why don't we just look for new tools altogether, new antibiotics or new approaches altogether like phage and things? Yeah, it's entirely possible that we get technological solutions to get us out of this, right? I mean, really, you know, much better antibiotics have been doing it for a while, right? And so totally resistant bugs is not quantitatively a huge problem, but I, I think it's not the long-term solution because what we've seen is sort of, sort of um, growing amounts of harm due to, due to things that are due to resistance like MRSA and VRE and, and Pseudomonas and so forth. So I don't think that we can entirely just get our way out of it with more drug. Um, I think you know, phage certainly um, have the potential to have a role. There's, you know, fascinating evolutionary biology related to the use of phage, especially combining with antibiotics. So I think that there are better um, ways of using those. But if the question is, you know, you know, why worry about the evolution just to just find better drugs? Um, if it were possible, um, I think it, I would be happy with that solution, right? To have drugs so good, you don't have to worry about the evolution. I just, it hasn't proved possible and I doubt it's going to be. Okay, I'm conscious we're up against uh, time, but uh, maybe one last question from Ed Legrand. No, we can't hear you, Ed. You're, you're muted. Thank you. There we go. I'll try, trying to unmute, okay. Um, if you're thinking of different alternatives, I would suggest considering what if you had no antibiotics? And in the case of the, uh, the infected um, access port, the problem there is a localized one. And what I might suggest is we use, um, consider antiseptics, consider heat, uh, radiation, whatever, nastiness in general, people use antibiotics because they don't cause tissue damage. But at some point, you have to recognize, well, in, as in the case of, of the patient described, there was an abscess there. So we had a lot of, we ended up with a lot of tissue damage. So I guess what I'm suggesting is if, you, if you're in a situation where you have access, localized access to the infection, one should take advantage of this localization. Now, I recognize that if you have a diffuse infection or you know, down in the pancreas, down in the liver, you can't do this. And so you're stuck with antibiotics. But in, in, in localized cases where you have access, then I would suggest using more nonspecific therapies. Let me bring up a, 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 real, ex a, a real example. I used to work um, on growth factors for wound healing. And um, all the surgeons, these are for non-healing ulcers, diabetic foot ulcers and so forth. We had platelet-derived growth factor. All our surgeons who worked on wound healing said, it'll never work unless you debride the wound back to bleeding tissue, mainly taking out essentially all the pathogens. They never really explained why. But I understand now. But I, back in 1990, I talked with um, an elderly friend who was a surgeon. And I said, you know, I'm working with growth factors for diabetic foot ulcers. He said, you know, that never was a problem for me. Back in the, probably back in the 50s. I would just soak those 
those feet in phenol, a nasty antiseptic, and they would all heal. And I'd never forgotten that. And it's like, at some point, getting rid of the bacteria is much more important than protecting the tissue. So when we're doing antibiotics, we're protecting the tissue, but we risk the bacteria getting ahead of us. And of course, anytime you have a, um, a device, you know, you're, you're talking about biofilms and persisters and refuges and so forth that were just discussed. So I would say take advantage of any kind of localized infection that you have access to and consider other than antibiotics. So there you go. Thanks, Ed. Bob, it's still a bit tight. So you want to give a quick reaction to that? Uh, that, that um, yeah, we're open to, to all sorts of solutions. Source control is clearly um, the, the one of the most important the tools we have. Um, that wasn't an option in this particular patient. Uh, but localized treatments uh, potentially have a role sometimes. But again, it's what we, we need evidence. Thanks very much, Bob. Meredith, there are, there are several questions, quite a few questions we're not going to have time to get to, but you presumably the recording does involve the questions as well. So Bob can reach out to the individuals. Yes, the, yeah. the, the chat's included with the recording, so. Excellent. Yeah, there's several great questions, Bob, worth looking into, and I hope you can get back to them. So from my point of view, thanks very much, Bob. That was really excellent. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Bob. That was fantastic talk. Uh, I'm, uh, I have to give a, I'm giving my lecture on antibiotic resistance, in my evolutionary medicine class on Friday. So we timed this perfectly. And I was uh, updating some of my slides uh, based on some of what you presented. Uh, so that was fantastic. And uh, thank you, John, for joining us. Uh, and hope to see you at future Club of Meds. It was really great to hear your perspective. And of course, Andrew, thanks for, for moderating and introducing uh, Bob and, uh, and John. Uh, before we depart, before we end, I want to uh, just quickly share the upcoming Club of Meds, if I can find that. Um, hopefully you're seeing my screen here with the Club of Med website. And here's the great talk we just heard uh, by Bob Woods. Um, in two weeks, we have my colleague Herman Ponser, who's going to be speaking about seven metabolic myths, evolutionary energetics and human ecology and health. And he'll be talking about a book that he is coming out, I think March 3rd, uh, it's coming out. And you can, I'm, because we're short on time, I'm just gonna scroll down and you can take a look at some of the other really great speakers uh, that we have coming up from across uh, many different fields and many different perspectives and uh, topics. So we really hope to see you guys at Future Club of Meds. Uh, thanks, thanks so much for joining and, uh, and thanks everyone who participated today, thanks.